did a trial run in the springtime of 1989 where they opened on April 15th to snowboarding. Well, the scene of snowboarding was great during that time. You would see somebody on the hill and if they had a snowboard on their feet, you'd pretty much go up and talk to them because you were like brothers. I mean, there wasn't a lot of us back then. It really started in the early 90s with guys like Damian Sanders and like Dana Nicholson. And those guys really showed the world how you could take skateboard tricks and put it on a snowboard. It had been 12 years since the advent of snowboarding. In that time, it had gone from savagery to the most dominating force in the ski slopes today. Billy Anderson, I'm 17 years old. The Man Flakes, California. Been snowboarding for about five years. So we learned to snowboard around 89 in June, and then that spring they allowed it at Mammoth. So, I mean, my first snowboarding here was like in ski boots on an avalanche kick before there was any parks. It all began before there was a park here in Mammoth, just riding the mountain. And then when the park came, it, it was just like, whoa, like here's another whole world of opportunity. And that's where we stayed. There, there's something to just like California culture that is a little more laid back, that can be a little bit more surfy, a little more, I guess, California. So when we got to the snowboarding part of it, like they embraced it. Whether it was just, you know, opening the snowboard shop or starting the snowboard parks. My Uncle Bill had a huge influence on it. He was a cat driver, knew that we were getting better, and he was just like pushing rollers and things like that that I don't even know if the skier knew he was doing it. It evolved, you know, and it's like it took time. And I remember the first time they built, you know, jumps and cats couldn't even, they didn't even have a blade that you could push steep enough to make a takeoff. So we'd push, push up those big, you know, whatever you call them, curbs of snow, and then we'd hand shovel everything. So it was like the first parks were all hand shoveled. And then when they started bringing in people like Chevet, Orin, that kind of era is like when it really kicked up because they actually put young guys that were passionate about the sport and they were giving them the keys. You know, it took a long time for someone to put a snowboarder in a cat. And I think Mammoth was probably one of the first people to do it. And I think that that was when the big shift was. It wasn't easy back in those days in Mammoth. You know, it was a race culture. So changing things over and trying to bring in these punk snowboarders was a real tough cultural change for them. The resort, uh, understood that there was this, you know, this customer that was out there. And, you know, we were able to, you know, get Billy and Jeff and those guys to get some exposure in the magazines and get in some videos. And we were able to show the management that, hey, you know, this actually does work and it will drive business. And they would give us a little bit more money and then we would do it a little bit more. I really think Josh Chavez had a big part in just building these huge jumps. I remember one season he built these like I think it was a triple line of jumps in the, in the main park and they were all really big. I think that season brought Mammoth to this spot of like a destination for people to come and ride the best park in the world. I think uh, when Dogger came there in 98, that was a big deal. And he actually showed up with you know, a bunch of pros, Peter Lyon and JP Walker and a bunch of guys, and they actually were filming in the park. And I was like, wow, this actually turned into something. We, were, we kind of made it, you know, for whatever that's worth. So then uh, the, the floodgates opened and it just became really big growth really fast. It just started blowing up. And Mammoth got to the point where it was ranked number three in the country for ski areas and there was a culture in town that was so vibrant because so many people were moving here. Well, and I think that that's what was just like so cool about that time. It's just like there, there was a spot and like, I don't, I mean, maybe it was like the North Shore. There's always like a proving ground, you know, and like that, that 2000, this was it. Like this was the North Shore, you know? Everyone was here. If you wanted to try and prove something to someone, like this, this was the spot. It was what it was the scene. It was the place to be. Like that's where you went to be a pro snowboarder, you know, or to try to be a pro snowboarder. I, 
I moved to Mammoth in the summer of 2000. At that same time, you know, a huge influx of kind of am riders, up and coming kids who all wanted to be pros moved here. And there were guys like Kyle Clancy, Zach Leach, Colin Langlois, Scotty Arnold, Charlie Maracci, Danny Cass. It was a pretty massive amount of kids who were all about 19 years old or so. And they all just had this dream of being pro snowboarders. And it's pretty insane because almost every single one of those kids became pretty big name pros. I think we all felt like we had the skill and we had the ability, but we didn't have the features to try these tricks on. So we came to Mammoth and it's the most perfect double line in the world, the most perfect half pipe, the best rails, and it's sunny and warm, and it was just game on. They had the deck there and it was just a normal deck for hanging out on with picnic tables and stuff, and people started kind of jibbing the deck rail and I think in a lot of resorts, they would have you know, yelled at you and told you to stop doing it. Whereas Mammoth thought, hey, why don't we just turn this into a feature in the park? So they basically turned a actual part of their lodge into you know, the park. And that's something that nobody was doing at that time. The big thing when I first got there, I think we had about eight or 10 metal features total. When I left, I think we were up to, you know, somewhere between 70 and 80. Tara Dakitas had her stand and deliver part, and that's when we had the yellow school bus in the Mammoth Park. And they like built a takeoff so that she could get up and jib the top of the bus and come off. And they were always down to just use the things that were around the park. Jeff, one of his first ads that we did with him was him you know, riding the bus, and then Kevin Jones came, and Kevin wanted to ride the bus, and then they wanted to ride the rail on the deck, and then they wanted to ride across the deck, and then they wanted to ride the utility building, so we just started finding things around the resort so people could jib. Probably the most memorable uh, moment for that is um, where we did the water tank, Kerr Wastel. We had this crazy idea, the town water tank, right? We built this tranny up to it, and Kurt was jibbing the top of the water tank. It was like 30 feet or something crazy, right? And there was this little 10 foot transition. It was really the first, for me, the kind of first part of, you know, jibbing today, right? How extreme can these guys get and just hit crazy stuff. I think the whole vibe of what was happening in Mammoth was with Kevin Jones, Tara Dakitas, uh, Grenade, Danny Cass, Eddie Wall, those guys really just set the tone for what was being done every day in that park. Oh, the heyday was definitely when the grenade was here. I remember that there were some times when <laughs> I drive into town and there was a hundred grenade stencils spray painted along the way on signs, on snow banks, on anywhere that you could stencil a grenade. It took this town by storm and Certain people loved it, and certain people hated it. It was definitely like the wild west of snowboarding. Once kind of, you know, once Grenade had kind of taken shape and the crew form, it was like, there was kind of like a no hold bars, almost like no one's really in control, wild west. You know, instead of guns, we kind of more had like spray paint cans. I think it's safe to say we really left our mark on this town. Anything that was flat or would hold paint got spray painted. The grenade guys came out and, and really left their mark here, and that was like a whole different era. And then now I would say that Mammoth is a place where, you know, progression is still happening. I guess that that was the one of the things just about the Mammoth Park, it's like, it's in a killer spot, the music's good, and it's sunny. You can ride here, you can ride that lift, and you can see essentially X Games runs going down constantly. kind of just like a playground for, for learning how to 
ride your snowboard really good. Cake, Todd. Thank you. You're giving me cake? What, you want to be in my movie or something? Oh, oh yes, please. And who pays the bills? My mom. Well, your <laughs> snowboarding bills. Uh, Burton and Volcom. And, um, uh, Burton and Volcom. <laughs> who inspires you? Uh, my brother Billy. Yeah. And, you... and Terry, bro. My name is Trevor Hersler, 20 years old, and I ride in Mammoth because Mammoth has probably the best train in California, I think. I like the jizz in the park and handrails and pipes. That's like, that's what I like to ride. I'm Blaze Rosenthal, and I like to ride Northern California because it's super fun, it's where I live, and I like it. Joe, J O E, Winnegar. <laughs> How long you been snowboarding, Jeff? I've been snowboarding for a year in New Jersey and three years in California. You got your own deal here in Mammoth, huh? Yep. Because everyone snowboards and hangs out with storm riders right here. Yeah. And we ride the mountain every day and they build us a park in the spring. So it works out good. Who's your favorite riders? Um. Bill Anderson, Jeff Rushy. I heard you sparred a lot, though. <laughs> yeah. Three, two, one.